Hi, this is Justine Toe and you're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. Well, International Women's Day falls on March 8 and its theme this time is Time for Action to End Violence Against Women. Now on this program we've spoken about gender-based violence that occurs in other countries, but today we're going to turn the spotlight on Australia, since for too many women the home is the most dangerous place for them to be. Statistics report that one in three women are or have been victims of domestic violence, but the real numbers may be higher. Before we hear from Elizabeth, a survivor of domestic violence, just a cautionary note, some of the material in this program may be inappropriate for young children to hear. I rang the police and two police constables came and one of them decided to take me in the police car down to the hospital to see. I did have a broken bone in my nose and my face was very damaged. While I was there at the hospital, I was counselled by a Salvation Army person who encouraged me that I could lay charges. But if I did, I would ruin my husband for life. And then the policeman basically said the same. I thought, well, I don't want to do that to him. So I decided not to lay any charges and I was taken home. When we got home, the other policeman came to the door and he just looked at me and he said, Everything will be all right now, because your husband's got some tablets to settle you down. At that point, something in me died, because you see, I'd stood up for what I thought I needed. Then I'd gone to where I thought I could get help. Two people, the church and the police were involved, and everyone concerned was indicating to me, in one way or another, that there was something wrong with what I had done. That was Elizabeth. That's not her real name, but what she describes is all too real, including the experience of being encouraged to protect her abusive husband who caused her suffering in the first place. Elizabeth's story is told in Dr Lynn Baker's book, Counselling Christian Women on How to Deal with Domestic Violence. We'll be hearing from Dr Baker later in the program. But first, we'll be talking to Captain Melanie Ann Holland. She's a manager at an inner Sydney women's refuge called Samaritan House. Such refuges provide a safe place for women and their children to stay. They also provide a range of counselling and legal services and support, whether that's in the form of food, clothing or resources. Captain Melanie Ann, thanks for joining us on Life and Faith. Oh, that's my pleasure. Thank you. Now, when women arrive at Samaritan House after escaping from violent or abusive situations, what are their immediate needs? Well, with with many of our clients coming in through domestic violence situations, they need to be initially accommodated, but there's many other needs that come with that, Um, particularly their need to feel safe, and to receive adequate support as they navigate through all the consequences of the violence that they've experienced. Mm. So that can be emotional, physical, spiritual, relational, financial. There's so many consequences that it can seem quite overwhelming. Yeah, and so it must be great for them to have the support of um, the workers at the refuge to, to be able to walk through that. I'm sure that for many women, it's a big step to leave and seek assistance um, from a refuge in the first place. And this might mean that they've been in a violent or abusive situation for a long time before they've sought help. Um, from your experience, what does that kind of prolonged experience of violence do to a human? Well, well, it... it it corrodes their sense of self. It corrodes all the dignity and the self-value that people hold for themselves. And um, and so that overflows into their understanding of how they relate. It, under, it impacts on their capacity to be able to make decisions for themselves and, and to just feel generally okay about who they are. It also means that they carry a huge sense of betrayal and fear. They can often feel conflicted that um, even as though they're to blame for the situation that they're in. And so there can be a lot of guilt and shame as well. Mm. And what kinds of impacts uh, do you see on children who accompany their mother to the refuge? Um, It's always enormous. Even if you think the domestic violence is hidden, it has tremendous impacts on the children and um, 
recent studies have shown that even very young children, babies, are impacted by domestic violence. It disrupts the development of their cognitive processes or the way that they process the world. And so living with anxiety and fear um, becomes normal, even from a very young age, and it disrupts how they can um, interact with the world. Um, it can then overflow, you know, as children get older into things such as learning difficulties, um, um, difficult behaviours, mental health issues such as anxiety and depression. Um, it impacts on how they understand relationships and we often find that um, in adulthood that we, uh, children that, that have experienced domestic violence will seek out similar types of relationships mm. because it's been normalised. Earlier you mentioned that <clears throat> there are spiritual needs of the women who come into the refuge. What are their spiritual needs in those circumstances and how do you attend to them? I would say that the needs in a general sense are for safe space and reassurance, um, for support in the decision making, um, for good listening and to hear messages of life and dignity as well as getting good counselling. Now my belief is that all of those things have a spiritual element to them so that they can hear the message of who God sees them to be. The, the person that was created for wholeness and dignity and love and um, all of these other elements of their care and support have that spiritual element to it that we want to see them restored to wellness and wholeness. Mm. And if anyone listening has experienced violence in their own lives and they haven't yet sought help, what would you like to say to them to encourage them to do so? I would want to say to any, any person that's experiencing violence in the home that it's not okay, that it's never their fault and that it's not okay to continually place yourself in that space, that there are ways to make it stop. And for the sake of yourself and if children are involved, for the sake of your children as well, to be able to either get out or make some other arrangements so that you have space away from those behaviours. And, um, and then you can work it out. But first of all, take the action to make the action the violence to stop. It's wonderful to get your thoughts, Melanie Ann. Thank you very much for joining us. No worries. Thank you. We've just been hearing from Melanie Ann Holland, a manager of one of the women's refuges operated by the Salvation Army. If you've just joined us on Life and Faith, we're discussing domestic violence in Australia in light of International Women's Day. We turn now to Dr Lynn Baker from the University of Queensland, where she teaches in counselling and educational psychology. Dr Baker is also connected with the Salvos. For three years, she worked as a Salvo care line counsellor and she continues to train counsellors on how to support people through domestic violence. We earlier heard Elizabeth's story from Lynn's book, Counselling Christian Women on How to Deal with Domestic Violence. Of course, the kinds of experiences of domestic violence described in the book are not confined to Christian women but will be applicable to anyone who's ever experienced violence. I spoke by phone with Lynn from Queensland. Now, you spent three years as a Salvo care line counsellor. Obviously, people ring in who are distressed for many different reasons. Domestic violence might be one of them. But when people do ring in, what do they most need from counsellors when they're calling in those situations? Initially, they need the counsellors to listen and listen carefully, to believe their story and to validate their feelings, to show them respect and also to ensure that they are safe right at that particular moment and ask them whether or not they are safe and then if they are not, help them to determine the best way to become safe and get to a safe place. So Lynn, when you heard Elizabeth's story for the first time, you must have been astounded that this was the reaction that she had. Yes, I, I was quite uh, surprised, but probably more than surprised, very disappointed in that somebody in a hospital setting, in a situation where a woman was so very obviously abused, would endeavour to protect the abuser mm. and not declare what the behaviour was and to take action to protect Elizabeth and to also ensure that she was safe because she was obviously not safe where she was. So yeah. I, I was very disappointed to hear that. 
Your book notes that while faith can be an enormous comfort to women who experience domestic violence, it can also be a huge hindrance to them because some Christian women feel like they must keep the um, the marriage intact regardless. So they basically have to put up with a violent spouse. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, I'd like to say, Justine, that faith can be a wonderful coping strategy. And many of the women in the study reported that their faith gave them strength to go on from day to day and eventually find a solution to the situation, which was usually leaving. But as far as the hindrance goes, some beliefs can hinder a person's ability to take appropriate action. So let's take, for instance, the concept that marriage is forever. It's a belief that is strongly held by many within the community. And while this belief is good and it's wholesome and well-intended, when domestic violence is concerned, when people attempt to live according to the very strong belief that marriage is forever, it can result in a woman remaining trapped within a domestic violence relationship, believing that leaving the relationship and also seeking divorce would be breaking a solemn vow. But the thing that I would like to state very, very clearly is that while it takes two people to enter into marriage as a binding agreement, it only takes one to break that agreement. And in the case of domestic violence, the union is broken not by the divorce, but by the actions of the perpetrator. So that means that the the abused woman does not need to stay, let's say, like she's not uh, being... She does not need to stay, she does not need to feel guilty about leaving because divorce is only the legal acknowledgement of the already broken relationship. Yeah. Can we talk about forgiveness and grace? Mm -hmm. Because this is obviously a wonderful message of the Christian story that Mm. puts no one beyond redemption. But, But how do we navigate this question of forgiveness when it comes to situations of domestic violence? First of all, I believe that we need to recognise forgiveness as a process. It's not just something that happens magically overnight because we think, well, we really should forgive that person. And there are those, unfortunately, who would actually push people to forgive regardless of the offence and the number of times it's been repeated. And this is really not a fair expectation. We have to understand that forgiveness can take time. Forgiveness is not a case of forgive and forget. It's not a case of allowing oneself or one's children to be continually abused. Forgiveness does not mean that the victim should remain with the abuser, attend mediation or consider reconciliation. All those things remain the choice of the victim. If that person wishes to leave, they are at liberty to do so. And I actually dare say that there would be people listening to this program who have remained in a relationship where domestic violence is being perpetrated against them because either they wanted to remain true to their vows or that they feel that they have to keep forgiving and that forgiveness means they have to stay. But forgiveness does not mean that they have to stay and the perpetrator behaviour should never be excused. The, the theme of International Women's Day is it's time to end violence against women. Now, what, what do you believe it will take to end violence against women, both within the church and also within the general community? That's a, a very deep question. Really, what we need is an increase in knowledge and acceptance of what actually constitutes domestic violence, that we need to accept that it is just not physical violence. There are many, many forms of domestic violence violence that come under that heading. We need openness to the fact that domestic violence is a significant problem within our society. I believe it happens far more frequently than many would realise. It's a challenge for everyone and I think everybody needs to look at that challenge and realise that they could have friends or work colleagues who are in fact victims of domestic violence even though it remains hidden. So beyond that, we need an increased willingness from each and every person to be, able, to be willing to assist where they can, rather than turning away and saying, look, this has got nothing to do with me. They need to have that willingness to step forward, speak out against domestic violence, and particularly for men, this may mean something as simple as disagreeing with comments made by a colleague or a mate. It might mean not laughing at or engaging with stories that reflect either violence or disrespect of women, either specifically or in general. And I think, too, that it takes each one of us 
to do what we can with what is available to us. One in three women experience domestic violence in Australia. It's a major public health issue and one found in faith communities just as much as in the general community. If you are a victim of domestic violence, can I encourage you to listen to what Dr Lynn Baker said as well as Melanie Ann Holland. Don't blame yourself. Don't lose hope. Seek help. There are plenty of options out there for you. You might want to check out Lynn's book to hear about the experiences of victims of domestic violence. Once again, it's counselling Christian women on how to deal with domestic violence. There's also, of course, the Salvo Care Line, which is available 24-7. You can call it on 1300 36 36 22.